stories, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Okay, you're now live, Chair. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. May I welcome you to the London Borough of New Harm Health and Adult Social Care Scrutiny Commission. Can everyone present hear me? If you can indicate by raising your hand, thank you very much. I can see you all. Uh, obviously, um, this is not our first meeting. We have done few meetings online and uh, likewise due to COVID-19, uh, we will uh, continue um, to go on Zoom and uh, public residents will be able to watch the meeting uh, via the link. Um, uh, YouTube link. Uh, we have Roger Raymond and uh, Richard Plummer with us to assist councillors and officers with technology. May I ask members to note that they must raise their hand in order to indicate that they wish to speak. I also want to remind members that if a voting is taking place at any time, it will be by way of raising your hands uh, like so in order that we can capture this on screen. Agenda item one, uh, apologies. Uh, Roger, do you have any apologies? Hello, Chair. I have apologies from Councillor Khan and Councillor Griffiths. Thank you, Councillor Khan and Councillor? Councillor Griffiths. Right. I also have apologies uh, from Councillor Sugar, and I believe Councillor Omena Gangadharan is not feeling well, but she was going to join us and leave probably early, but I can't see her. If she cannot join us, you might have to note her apologies, please. A declaration of interest. Are there any member wishing to make any declaration of interest? Okay. No, right. Agenda item four, minutes of the meeting took place on 18th of November, 2020. Uh, we don't have the minutes available right now. And I understand that we should be able to have the minutes at the next meeting. In At this moment, if I can add that, I understand that our officers are quite struggling at the moment. I think due to COVID-19, we are having some additional meetings, but I feel quite uh, bad for our officers. They're, they're struggling. They have been doing not only research work, attending meetings, and then struggling with timing. I am not sure uh, how my colleagues feel that if there is any way we can ask for additional support. Uh, a year ago from today, we had more uh, member of staff than what we have today, but um, our meetings, number of meetings have increased, meaning uh, we are having more uh, time from our staff and resources. Um, so I can understand that, but then on the other hand, it is not fair if we don't get paperwork on time um, and I am not blaming anyone, but this is something we must talk to the appropriate place at the appropriate time um, and make sure that our staff are supported and getting enough support for themselves to support us. Is, is it uh, something agreed by colleagues? Do you think it's reasonable? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I understand you are agreeing with me, so thank you. I welcome Councillor Gangadharan. Hope you are feeling better. Agenda item five, long COVID clinics. I am delighted to welcome to this meeting, Councillor Zulfikar Ali, the cabinet member for health and adult social care. Councillor Ali, you have always been good with information and attending the meeting, so we appreciate that. We also have uh, Steve Peacock, program director uh, from uh, Well CCGs and John Rock, Director of Delivery Newham CCG. I welcome you both. I don't think I can see anyone else. Uh, if, I, if I'm missing anyone, um, Councillor Ali might be able to introduce them later on. I'm really pleased uh, to welcome you all. Um, in the meantime, I would say Councillor Ali, uh, I will invite you to have your opening uh, remark and then take it from there. Thank you, Councillor Ali. 
Thank you very much indeed, Chair. Thank you, and thank you, members, for inviting us. And I'm really pleased that colleagues from CCG are here to provide us an update on these two key service areas. Um, as you know, Chair, since the first phase of pandemic, our services have been impacted quite severely. So support for our residents is absolutely critical. And the post-COVID situation is something that does need attention. And I'm grateful to officers for coming forward with a report which, which tells us uh, exactly how we're going to move things forward uh, uh, you know, over a period of time. But um, Chair, as you know, that uh, the, the situation with COVID isn't getting any better. And uh, we are now in the second phase and possibly the third phase in January, who knows? So the message is absolutely clear that we need to, to do all we can to make sure we remain safe. And uh, may I also say, Chair, that these topics are regularly in this, uh, on agenda for Health and Wellbeing Board, uh, which we have been meeting quite frequently. And uh, I also discussed these with uh, my one-to-one -one meeting with CCG staff and the Chief Executive and Medical Director in New General Hospital. But uh, the situation at the moment isn't very good at all. As you know, Chair, our neighboring boroughs, Havering, Redbridge, um, and the northeast corner of London, effectively, you know, even though we're in tier two, the numbers here in Havering and Redbridge are quite substantially high, and we are falling behind with them uh, and Waltham Forest, and that is affecting our community quite a lot. In terms of the long COVID uh, reports, Chair, uh, I, as I said earlier, I really welcome the um, report and officers. Uh, to, to hotel who is going to be uh, taking you through in terms of what we are doing in order to assist our community, uh, not only in Newham, but across Northeast London. The model being suggested, it demonstrates the importance of good primary care for residents and the skill that you know, our health practitioners have in this area. And they're used to delivering similar schemes as part of the post-rehabilitative care. And of course, Chair, from social social care perspective, we are there to support our partners in, you know, in any form or shape that we need to. And may I also say that in um, our deliberation on this, uh, you know, we have raised a few issues with colleagues in terms of the current situation and the capacity to run this pathway in addition to other services being delivered by primary care. And obviously the length of time that these clinics may remain in, in place, and who knows when COVID will end and uh, how this will impact on timelines for referrals for being screened and assessed. So there are issues, but clearly the, the, the package that officers are coming forward with uh, is a good model. And I hope that you will find this beneficial, informative, as well as something that you can also obviously you know, question and, and seek further information. So without further ado, I will hand over to John. Are you taking this on? Yeah. No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Steve take this away. Yeah. Okay, Steve's here. Yeah, I didn't see Steve earlier on, so I thought I'd pass to you. Okay. I, I welcome you. Steve, and uh, yeah, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Um, there is a, um, a slide deck, I think, in the agenda pack that, that um, goes through what we're trying to do. So I'll, I'll just make a few uh, remarks to um, put some detail on that. <clears throat> um, the first thing to say is... The Sorry, Chair. I'm on two screens. Are we looking at something that's entitled Community Pathway and then um, is actually pre prepared on a supplementary agenda for the Waltham Forest Health and Wellbeing Board? Is that the paper we're looking at? It's a similar presentation, but there should be one with, with Newham on it, actually. Yeah. <laughs> well, what's on my screen? It's on the council website. It's entitled Waltham Forest um, right, Health and Wellbeing it. Board. And it's a okay. series of slides it, sorry, that begin be post-COVID-19 community Com pathway. Councillor Wilson, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of asking one of the officers if it is possible to share the screen so that viewers from the live can see as well. Is it appropriate and possible, officers? Yes. Or, or perhaps give Steve the, the co-host, right? And Steve can share it. Yeah, I, I actually can't share it because I've had to okay. open up on a new, okay. uh, on a different laptop because I haven't got uh, Zoom on my work laptop. I, I okay. see. So what about Ro Roger or Adrian? Anyone can help? Yeah, hold on. Just give, just give me 
give me a couple of minutes and we'll get it all sorted. Okay. While you are Hold working on, on this, is that I the think document Councilor... that we're looking at? Sorry, I haven't exactly, established it's, it's, if I'm on the right page. It's the same yeah, okay. slide, yes. Sorry, yeah, Councillor, yeah, this one I think is a good point, not only for us, but also for the viewers who are watching exactly. us from live. Yeah. We try to do this as we can. It, yeah, thank it, you. Yeah. Uh, Councillor uh, Winston uh, Bond, did you want to say something? No, I just merely want to suggest that Roger would be helpful in this matter. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He always so maybe is helpful. We, <laughs> yeah. While Roger is trying, um, <laughs> shall we continue? Can I just, while I've got the floor, as it were, um, it, it, is it me? Um, but bear in mind, Steve, we've been on Zoom calls all day, so you'll probably get some of this coming through. I don't like three-letter acronyms, but we've got this, and I come from an education background. I know what they all mean normally when I'm at school governors, but I make a point of stopping it. And remember that we have open to the public the whole point of health scrutiny. Can you still hear me even while this thing's going on? Yeah, we can hear you. Right. Yeah. We've got an objective being existing MDT approaches. Yeah, I'll, I'll explain MDT that. when it's at home. I'm sure Steve are. can explain that. Yeah. There we are. The presentation is up. Uh, Steve, is this the presentation? That's the one, yes. I'm sorry about the. There was obviously a mix up somewhere in the emails I was sending to. Um, various people in the CCG before they came to you. So this it's the same presentation, apart from the title. I did do one with um, a new Health and Social Care Scrutiny Committee on the front of it. Um, however, if we move off the title page, it'll become less, um, less contentious. So <laughs> the, the next slide um, basically sets out what our objectives are. Um, if we go back one to the aim and objectives, it's it's it, as uh, Councillor Ali said, which is the um, it, it's to respond to the um, the needs of people who it became apparent during the spring and summer that there was a group of patients who had had COVID-19 who were coming forward with um, enduring symptoms 12 weeks after their uh, COVID illness, um, which uh, were um, obviously caused by the COVID illness because there was no other cause, but were not related to the largely um, respiratory nature of that illness. And when the, the slide later on will show what they are, but this, this group of patients often have multiple um, issues um, and the range in severity from slight to quite severe. Uh, the patients who have them um, are generally younger than we're used to providing for in our community services. So this is why we've had to respond um, to the service. Essentially what, um, it's, it's not the services that they knew particularly, though we may have to enhance them. Um, it's the patients that they knew. They're, they're generally um, <clears throat> younger. They're people who often have um, mental health needs, again, of varying severity but there will be people who gen generally were fit and well until they had their COVID illness. Um, <clears throat> and as well as being suddenly less able um, in their cognitive, physical or mental health, um, they, they've also got the, the if you like, the, the added stress of not quite knowing what's happened to them. And there may well be people who have been economically active and need support to get back into, into work. So <clears throat> the, uh, the, the objective then is to provide this multidisciplinary response um, based on uh, a, a multidisciplinary team assessment and then routing people into whichever services they require. So the, the next slide um, gives the, um, the principles that we've stuck by. And I see Roger suddenly uh, got up, but I'll, if I go through them, basically, what I said earlier, um, it's not the service that's new, it's the people. So we're building on existing services. These people will present through primary care, whether they were discharged from hospital or manage their COVID illness in the community. They'll present at primary care either for the 12 week post discharge um, <clears throat> follow up or their GP will know them because of their COVID illness. And so the referral into the assessment service will come from primary care. And uh, what we've said is we will use existing 
single points of access that all our community servers in our three boroughs have and the new one is through the um, extended primary care team and we've been talking to them in fact we had a meeting with them later this afternoon just to um, <clears throat> ensure that we've got a route into that service for this group of people that they'll get the appropriate assessment and we have um, a clear route into the type of services they need. Um, <clears throat> there is a need to, um, as we said, a bolster the services and there is some national funding. It's not a lot, it's 10 million pounds nationally and just to share in Newham is about 64,000 pounds. So it will enhance the ability of these teams to do the assessment, but we, 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 we may well have to think about um, <clears throat> investing further in some of the community services if they come under pressure <clears throat> because we don't know yet what the full demand of this service is going to be <clears throat> we've got some idea of the numbers coming through we don't know how long their um, condition is going to last um, <clears throat> and we don't know yet what the effect of improved treatment as we as um, our acute services have learned from the first wave of COVID-19 how better to treat patients through the second wave. So we'll, we'll, we'll be monitoring closely what the demand coming through the system looks like. A uh, small number, <coughs> excuse me, small number of these patients will have complex needs. Um, they'll have quite severe symptoms and they may have a range of them. And they will need then services from, um, from BARTS. Um, and we're working with them to set up um, probably a virtual clinic. It won't be a single clinic for long COVID patients because there'll be relatively few of them and they'll have a whole range of needs. So it's what we're looking for from the hospital is a single, again, a single point of access where these patients can be referred into and then they will be um, referred on to whichever specialties they need to see. And the reason we're having, if you like, a, a special point of access for them is some of them will need to see more than one specialist. And rather than what would happen now is because it's relatively rare, the patient would see one specialist and be referred on to the next one and possibly the next one. We'll have a, uh, a multi-specialty response so that they'll be able to be seen by all the specialties they need to be seen by quickly. <coughs> um, the go live date is intended to be uh, Monday for the referral from GP into the services, but I, I think we may give people um, a few days grace just to make sure they got the arrangements up and running and have a chance to, to check that. Uh, I was talking to the, um, as I said, the service in Newham, and I think they, they would prefer to have a few more days while they sort it out. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll work that one through with them and we'll write out to GPs tomorrow with a, a day they can start referring. Um, I suppose what that says is um, the, the clue in that is we've been doing this very quickly. And um, I think I'd probably have liked to have been um, better at engaging people as we've done this, but we just haven't had the time to do it. We're, we're only just engaging with the uh, social care teams in, in, in the boroughs, for instance, um, who, who will be part of the response to this. We've been focusing on setting up the, um, the assessment response, which is essentially um, uh, one that is, has a core element of physiotherapy, occupational therapy and psychology. Uh, and it's getting that set up that we've been focused on. And the development of the other services attached to it will, will essentially be iterative. We'll be learning as we go along if, as new needs uh, become apparent as the level of demand becomes apparent and how the patients are signed posted into other services, um, we, we can see where uh, most patients are going. This slide, um, it's not a scientific um, assessment of demand. Um, it's, it's a fairly crude piece of work that was done by the respiratory clinic in Barts, which was getting all the referrals for patients recovering from uh, COVID. And it was them who, uh, and a few others around the country, who um, first spotted that this group of patients were coming forward with a whole range of different symptoms. And you can see from this that there are um, 
this whole range of, I think I can't see the bottom corner because our, our pictures are, I think it's 10 or 11 different symptoms um, that are quite significant here. And you can see there are a range of different um, acute specialties or things that can be supported by community rehabilitation. Breathlessness, fatigue, um, uh, rehabilitation issues, memory, concentration, sleep, is that mental health needs? MSK is joint pain. Some people have pins and needles in their muscles. Um, you know, it's a whole range of things. Some people just have one of these symptoms. Others have several of them. Um, and the severity of the symptoms here at this stage isn't related to the severity of the COVID-19 illness. Um, some patients have quite severe post-COVID syndrome, post-COVID syndrome, sorry, uh, who had quite a mild um, COVID illness. So it, it, it's, it's a bit of a mystery. So if we move on to the next slide, it's, uh, this, this is where we've got a better picture of the level of need. This is for Newham. Uh, huge caveat around this, there hasn't been much um, data collected on, on this group of patients. And this is based on uh, some work that was done, I think in Hackney, largely. It may have there may have been there's another piece of work that covers new and tower hamlets as well but it's mostly been an audit of patients in hackney but it's it's translatable into new it's also fair to say that this is probably an overestimate um when we discussed it with a group of clinicians um it was felt to be an overestimate but i'd much rather go high than go low and get caught out um the figures toward the bottom um are probably approaching the peak numbers unless we get another big surge in in the COVID illness because these are the patients who will be coming through from the second uh, surge in cases um, in the autumn. Um, the, so that number for this service we're talking about here is the numbers that are 34 at the bottom and so you can see how they're increasing over time. Um, we'd expect to see that number drop as we start to get the effects of the second lockdown coming through in, in, in a few weeks' time. <clears throat> um, another thing to say about those numbers, which is important, particularly in the context of Newham and indeed wider in East London, <clears throat> is that uh, those are the numbers across the whole population we'd expect to be seeing with this illness. We're not seeing this level of people coming forward to see their GPs into primary care. Um, an audit again done in, done in Hackney um, showed that almost all, I say almost all, but certainly a large majority of the, of the patients who were coming forward to primary care with long COVID were um, largely white, uh, relatively affluent and well-educated, um, as is the way with things. These you know, the people who um, are articulate know their way around the system and no way to go. Um, so part of this work will be to uh, have a campaign to reach into the population. We know in this part of the world, as in the rest of the country, that COVID-19 disproportionately affected people from Black, Asian and minority ethnic populations and people who are economically disadvantaged. <coughs> we know what the, um, the profile of um, occupations in, in Newham and the rest of East London is. A lot of people work in populations, in sorry, in occupations that were exposed to um, COVID-19. So we've got some work to do there um, in order to make sure that people are aware that the service is there. And indeed, I think in a lot of cases, aware that they're um, feeling unwell or sickness or illness or se severe debilitating condition is due to their COVID illness and that uh, uh, we have this service for them. We'll have to, we'll, we'll be doing that work in, in coming weeks once we have the services set up. Um, you can see on the left there, I, I talked about the, the ones with people with complex needs. That is a much smaller number. It's 0.6% as opposed to 47 So it's about an eighth of those numbers. <clears throat> so it is quite small. It's, it's four at the height of the, um, uh, the demand there. So the next slide is, sorry, Roger, can you move on to the next one so I can remember what it is? 
<clears throat> that's the one. So this is the this is the the care pathway. Sorry, the the one with the um the red the red, yellow and green boxes. That's the one. That's the this is a, a, a schematic of the care pathway, um, which the the key uh, boxes are um, the green, yellow, and red ones in the middle, which um, patients will see their GPs. GPs will risk stratify them, and that's a, you know a fairly scientific term for what will be a not particularly difficult task. But we have got some tools available if should GPs require them. Um, the people in the green box who will continue to be managed by their GP or just by themselves, referred for social prescribing, uh, possibly for some um, psychological support, or to the uh, Your COVID Recovery website, which has been produced by NHS England. Um, they won't be referred for a further assessment. Um, the second group who have a medium level of need uh, will be the ones who will be uh, supported by community services. They will go to the multidisciplinary team for assessment and will have a range of needs that are um, supportable through community services. <clears throat> then people with higher, more severe or complex needs, they'll be the ones that will be referred into secondary services um, for at least part of their treatment. And, and they will be referred on to the BART service. Um, as you can see on that, there's a range of um, uh, diagnostic tests that are there and recommended for GPs to use should they need them. Um, they may, may well need them for people who are more uh, severely affected by the syndrome, but for the majority of patients, it will be a face-to-face -face, uh, assessment by the GP to, to send them uh, to the appropriate service. Uh, there is a questionnaire available. If we move to the next slide, just for illustrative purposes. Sorry, Roger, the next slide, please. That's great, thanks. Uh, this is, um, in many ways, it, it's quite a simple thing from a patient's perspective, which is how, um, how severely is your functioning affected rather than trying to analyze the disease. It's, it's what are you able to do and what can't you do now that you used to be able to kind of thing. And there can then be um, quite easily categorized into um, those grade zero or one, which don't require any further service or can be managed by the GP. Then grade two and grade three, they will go for the multidisciplinary assessment and referred into community services. And then grade four, the ones with more severe uh, limitations who will need probably to see specialists in the hospital. So that, that's illustrative really just shows uh, mm -hmm. the, the ways people are affected. And then finally, the last slide uh, shows some of the issues that we've been having. If we can just move on, Roger. Thank you. These are the issues that we're facing as we're implementing uh, this new service. Um, I think the main one for me is that first one. Mm -hmm is making sure that this demand on services doesn't um, put other um, patient groups at a disadvantage. Um, so the majority of people have seen by, for instance, the um, extended primary care team, that they're housebound, much older people. Mm. What we don't want to do is have um, the demand from this service putting too much pressure on the existing extended team and mean, meaning that they can't provide such a good service to um, existing patients. So this is what, as I said at the beginning, we'll be closely monitoring the demand and looking at how we can ensure that that doesn't happen and how we might be able to invest further in services where there is particular pressure on it. Then involvement of other specialties, that's essentially making sure that um, we can access um, services where we need to that we can get people referred into um, BARTs and we've already reached agreement that uh, they will take referrals from the multidisciplinary team um, rather than it have to be a medical um, referral. So we'll have a strong link between the BART service and this one. They're, they're the main issues for me at the moment. <clears throat> Primary care will be very important. I think as uh, Councillor uh, Ali said at the start, um, they'll be key to making sure that patients um, are um, referred into this service where they need it and that they identify the, the, the long COVID patients.
for the service. Um, so thank you for the opportunity for me to take you through that. Um, I'll take questions, of course, and see if John wants to add anything from the viewing perspective. Uh, nothing, nothing to add. Happy to contribute to the question answering. Though. Thanks, Steve. Hello. So thank you. Very Alex, can you hear me? I can now. We lost it for a bit, I think. Yeah. I think we're right. gradually coming back. Winston's still frozen and so is Daniel. I think we're going to have to be a bit patient, Steve. Sorry. Okay. So we does it mean one. that are we individually having problem or the problem no, is... No, I think it's somebody's platform there. Okay. We went all unstable. Right. Sorry, you said you can't not see back. me. He's frozen. and me. Okay. Now I think we all are okay coming back soon. So for a few seconds or a minute, we were uh, sort of like lost. Um, apology for the um, is the IT or internet connection. But what I'll do, I'll take a question from, I can see Councillor Wilson um, has already raised his hand. Anyone else with question? Um, so after Councillor Wilson, I'll go to Councillor Blainley. Thank, 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 thank you very thank, much, Chair. Um, I just want to. Find was it out. me? I so, thought it was sorry, me. Sorry, it was Neil Wilson, then Blaley, and then Councillor Vaughan. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Vaughan, you did not hear me yet. So, so I'll take Councillor Wilson first. Thank you. Second, <laughs> Blaley, and then uh, it's you, Councillor Vaughan. It Third, was a very crucial you. slide that went off the screen and then we all froze. Yeah. So it was the last points. Thank you very much, Steve, for the presentation about the implementation issues. Don't want to get us too sort of high bound in some of the medical stuff, really. It's, we're here to sort of look from a scrutiny point of view about implementation. Now, we're we're told today, as well as what uh, Councillor Ali rightly referred to, was uh, the you know the bad tendency, you know, to go into the wrong end of cases rising. And just as an aside, it's interesting that the BBC has been saying on its website that cases were falling, and now they've changed the bar chart into the opposite direction after about. A fortnight but there we go anyway it says maintaining services for non-covid as well as covid patients this is an item on our agenda and we will take it up in the new year i think you rightly said um i'm going to be a bit of a teacher on you and say i think that means proportionate approach to providing services that word it's just a spelling <laughs> type of that, but we're all under pressure uh, oversight of rehab services to ensure proportionate approach we've got 4.4 million in the queue well, hospital services, the biggest ever in the NHS, 4.4 million. And behind some of what we're trying to do here throughout is about staffing. So I understood that community services were already under pressure. Community services can't be at face to face because of various issues. We've got staff sickness. We've got no testing, even in Havering, we're told on the BBC tonight, even though it's got the highest um, figures. So, you know, do, I, I'm just uh, worried that, you know, we've got a relatively small cohort of patients, but rightly needing some attention. How far will we be have sufficient staff to do this multidisciplinary team approach? You see where I'm going with it? I think it's because it's across the piece, isn't it? It's not just in Newham, it's the whole of the parts in Northeast area. So the figures for this service are relatively small, but they do need some quite intensive work by definition. Yeah. Thank you, Consul. I don't know if that's a question, really, or just a statement of whether anybody wants to reply to that. <laughs> Are you just agreeing uh, uh, with me? I, I, I will take it as a statement, but then again, Steve, do you want to uh, I just wonder whether I was over-egging it or whether they, they, Steve or, or John thought it was a real issue. For, we should, we should. So, go, on, go on, Steve, you start. I'll start by saying what we're doing immediately to take that into account or, and, and to acknowledge it, it, it could be an issue which is um, where we're putting this additional funding we have, which is, uh, again, talking to the, the team in Newham. And we've got a slightly different solution in each of our three boroughs. The Newham um, solution is, they, they have been quite clear in saying that their service is stretched already. And mm -hmm. if numbers are significant, then, then we will need to look again at how we deliver it. But what we're doing first, the first thing we're doing is, is um, using that money to buy not 
it, it will buy one fairly senior therapist, but rather than buy one physiotherapist or occupational therapist or psychologist, they're probably going to buy some time from each and have set time, some time sorry clinics set times for assessment clinics where they can right. get together mm -hmm. as a team and assess these people separately from mm -hmm. the usual cohort of patients who see that service. Because just before John comes in, I was horrified that you said it was 64K. I mean, we're going to have the second largest population in the, of any London borough, you know, projected. We're already under pressure and 64K doesn't seem to pay for anything much, you know, in the context of the health service. Yeah, I, it's, I, it's I only the chairs to agree. Be, you know, yeah. if it was 640K, I would have thought it was more of the scale Logic of it. sort of setting up some teams. But anyway, mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I think I think it's fair to say um, prior to COVID, uh, the challenge of the NHS switched from being one of a affordability issue to one of a workforce issue. Mm -hmm. so we ended COVID in a relative workforce crisis with uh, at least one in ten substantive clinical posts not being filled, uh, and in some areas uh, a real challenge. So we entered this with some problems, um, and. The recovery of services is, of, of course, challenged by uh, the ability to manage safely and effectively infection control. So we've restored as fast as possible we can those other services, those planned care services, surgery outpatients, where it's safe to do so. Um, they, they're not fully utilised in the way that they were, um, which does give us in the meantime a little bit of capacity and leeway uh, with some staffing, not in every department. Uh, but enables us to at least establish some of these services. Um, and given that we are part way through this, as Steve's done some forecasting, we don't fully know yet what the demand is going to be, particularly when we start to uh, try and find those people who are not presenting themselves uh, for such services at the minute, um, but are being managed either by themselves with uh, a, a bit of hardship or being very managed very well by their GPs. Um, so as we start to restore services, try and find the people who are vulnerable and been affected to COVID will then start to understand what this demand actually means. Um, at the same time as trying to balance the current response with a very challenging infection rate in Newham in North East London uh, with that balance of responding to COVID as well as working down that very large backlog of, of patients patiently waiting for their services. Thank, thank you, you Jess. I'll let others come in. Thank you. Thank, thank you. It's very kind of you. Thank, thank you. And thank you, John, Steve, both. Uh, Daniel Plainly, Councillor Daniel Plainly. Yeah, thank you. I've got a, a, some related open questions. Um, they're not loaded questions. I don't know what the right answer is. I'm not trying to suggest uh, anything. Um, is there any ability or to what extent is there an ability to relate this work to... Uh, research uh, that may be going on more widely around this issue because obviously it's new um, and uh, it desperately needs um, better understanding um, and I appreciate there's a, there's a resource issue there um, and you talked about sort of making sure that it's not a certain cohort who are getting um, uh, treatment um, but also, as just mentioned, there's uh, there's capacity issues and how much uh, kind of non-self-reporting is kind of uh, um, uh, kind of desired, I suppose. Thinking in particular about, and this relates to my question about research, the extent to which long COVID uh, understanding mild long COVID or the more mild aspects of long COVID kind of may have on society in the, the months and maybe years um, ahead and how we need to understand that. So there are a few sort of open questions from an amateur who doesn't really, who's curious as to how this is all being addressed. But thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. Is it John or Steve who want to? Um, should I pick up on the, on the research uh, point? Um, it, it's a well-made point because if there's one thing we need on this, it's, it's, it's to know more about it. Um, and 
um, if I remember rightly, um, we're linked into a London-wide approach to this. And I believe um, there is a research project, and I can't remember where it is, but in one of the uh, universities in, in, in London, um, that, that is, um, if you like, a bit of a serious research um, taking place. I think it's University College who are doing it. Um, and in fact, we are hoping to, to link into the, to um, them via University College Hospital who may provide um, the high-end specialty service to um, those patients who are very seriously affected by this, as well as the BART service. Um, more locally, we are talking to um, the, um, I forget what they're called now, the clinical something group at uh, Queen Mary. Um, they're involved in this as well and, and are helping as, as um, to uh, work through it. And so they would, I'm sure, be um, learning from it too. In terms of, in terms of non-self-reporting being a good thing, um, I, I don't think it ever is really. Um, I think all that does is suppress demand for the time being and, and it results in a system that's systematically and endemically unfair. So I think we need to, we need to avoid that at all costs. Um, and that's why I was saying one of our priorities. In fact, I started the kickoff meeting we had with a presentation from somebody who had done a lot of work with disadvantaged communities particularly. Um, and that obviously um, included a lot of the um, Black, Asian, minority ethnic communities too. Um, and the impact of COVID on those communities in, in East London. So it's, it's there in our thoughts. And now we've, we've, we've just been working so hard on actually getting people on board to provide the service. We can now go and do some work capturing the patients that are out there who need it. And the long lasting issues, it's part of the research question. We're not sure yet. Undoubtedly, there will be some people whose lives it changes and we need to bear that in mind um, and make sure that the services continue to be relevant to their needs. That, that, that's all I want to say on that. I don't know if John wants to add to it. <clears throat> so I think I'd just, just add to that, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence um, is producing its guidelines on on this in this very month, you know, nearly a year after this virus started presenting it. And I think they would say that they're basing that on available evidence that they've managed to gather on a very new disease. Um, so in, in some ways, we're still researching, we're still learning. Um, and I think our experience in this will contribute to that. Um, that said, without COVID, people with quite significant reactions to viruses are managed all the time by their GPs, by other health professionals and their post-viral symptoms. Um, and sometimes they get better and sometimes they have you know, lasting impact. That's the impact of some of these viruses. Um, we're just waiting really to see to what extent long COVID uh, remains a debilitating issue for people. I think we've all probably got examples of people we know who sense of smell has not returned after best part of 11 months and wondering whether it, it ever will. Um, we, we're, we're waiting to see, to be honest, um, and finding our way with this. Um, and I think just to go to the point about trying to make sure we access the right people, we'll be doing a lot of work with the, the GP practices in, in Newham uh, through our communications routes to make sure that the people who have symptoms who are right and relevant for this service come forward as, as best possible. So we deliberately try to case find um, uh, for those appropriate people for this service. Um, thank you. Uh, Councillor Blainley, do you have any supplementary question or shall I go to Councillor Vaughan? I think I half thought I did, but I've now forgotten it, so don't worry. I'll, I'll let you come back later on. Councillor Vaughan. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I think um, I'm right in understanding that you said these clinics would be virtual. Is that right? The the, uh, the clinic at at Bart's for the patients who need um, acute, more specialised care will be yes. Right. So how then are they going to be managed? Now the, the GPs are going to be responsible for the clients that probably are on his register, his or her register. So how would the patients be nursed? Because it would seem one of the statements you made is that one of the questions which 
would be put is could they manage on their own? Could they look after themselves? So in the case of those people who can't look after themselves, how would they be treated um, or nurse? So the second one, sorry, and the second question, I think you've answered the, the BAME community because uh, as we know, the BAME community is more affected uh, in any community than the others. So what program do you have in mind in order to attract the BAM communities? Thank you. Steve? Um, the, the first question about um, the clinic's been virtual. And so that I, what I was talking about there was the, um, the route into um, the service and for assessment uh, in the hospital. That, that, that is the virtual one um, because that would essentially be, the referral will be sent to, let's call it a post box in Barts where for each individual, um, they will contact the relevant specialties involved and then it'll get real rather than virtual in that the clinicians will um, assess the needs and they may see the patient virtually as they're seeing a lot of patients now from Barts um, by telephone or video link, but the treatment, if they need it, will be provided in real time. <clears throat> For those in the community who need support in, in living at home, they will get real support. That won't be virtual. That will be real. It will be the only virtual part will be the assessment, um, or at the um, the more complex end from the hospital, maybe the outpatient part of the service. <clears throat> but uh, people will will get face-to-face -face care if they need support living at home, for instance. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. In terms of programmes for uh, reaching out to communities, <clears throat> um, we haven't designed them yet. Um, what I have got is um, a group of people who are very keen to support that work, who are more expert at it than I am, whose job it is to do it. Um, and, and I'll be talking to them over the, the coming weeks and putting together a programme based around um, a publicity campaign and other outreach work using <clears throat> the various organisations that exist in, in Newham and indeed in the other boroughs um, and, and any other means of communication we can to get the message out there. <clears throat> I haven't really uh, done enough on that yet just to give you a, an example of what we're going to be doing but if, if you'd like us to come back and say what we're going to be doing in future more than happy to do that. Yeah, yeah, it would yeah, be I, nice, probably. Yes, Councillor Vaughan, you got a supplementary question? Um, not at this time. I, I uh, did have uh, one or two. No yes, problem. I, I think... you, are not, you are not pressurized to ask supplementary question, by the way. <laughs> no, I, I think it, we've got an idea if they can actually return uh, at some other point in time to let us know how they're um, getting on with that. But yes, um, I, I think my other question would be, Financially, would, would this be the responsibility of the CCG or would the local authority have to bear some financial responsibility for this as far as new residents are concerned? So I think it'll be, <clears throat> there'll be a combination. So depending on the needs, you know, we, we have our statutory duties across health and social care to respond to that. And, uh, and indeed we'll do that in, in time honoured fashion. So um, I think certainly the, the pathway that, that Steve outlined earlier, that, that will be funded by, by the NHS. Um, the mental health support that's that required for, for certain individuals will be funded by the NHS. Uh, those with chronic fatigue and, uh, and other uh, illnesses will be funded by, by the NHS. However, if there are requirements for people to uh, need social care, they'll be met in the same way as they are today by the council. I think that the, the challenge we've got with this is we don't have a, a, a an accurate register of who's had COVID-19. Indeed, a number of people uh, don't know they had COVID-19 and may have long COVID as a result of it and not realise they've got long COVID, just don't feel very well. So our identification of, of the needs is, is challenging. And that's why I think coming back to say who is presenting how are they presenting? How are we dealing with it? Who do we think we're missing? I think is an important learning process for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you. Councillor Gangadharan. Uh, good evening, Steve and uh, John. It was interesting to know about the care pathway of the long COVID clinics. Long before the COVID arrival, we were talking about the GP appointments delay and timings, long delays up to a week or more. And then on top of it, we are in the middle of winter or we are approaching hard winter. And so GPs will have more burdens on them. Now we have got the long COVID clinics as well. Is there going to be any additional help for the GPs? In New York, we have got about 162 GPs or about that much practices. And then how do we manage the community? And on one side, we have got more popular growth in the population. How do we manage it? Are we going to supply more money to through the CCG into the GPs? So a, a considerable investment has been made um, starting last year in workforce to support uh, general practice and broader primary care services. Um, so that investment was made um, by NHS England, recognising the workforce challenges. So a an aging and increasingly retiring group of practice nurses and GPs needed a different response because we were not going to be able to replace them like for like. Um, so what, what's happening now is new additional roles are being uh, invested in um, by NHS England in our general practices to support the needs of, of local people. So th those, those roles range from people who are called social prescribers who help guide and uh, guide and support individuals presenting to the right services, whether they be voluntary sector, whether they be healthcare, whether they be social services. Um, there are uh, psychological therapists, there are physiotherapists, there are paramedics, there are other roles that are being introduced into the spectrum of, uh, of support that we call, we call primary care or general practice to enhance and support more multidisciplinary team working. Um, so, uh, there are, I think, probably about over 100 new roles being introduced into Newham's general practices over the next year or so. I forget the exact figure, um, but I can happily supply it afterwards of investment in, in bolstering that to provide better access um, and provi provide more resilience to hardworking GPs and practice nurses. Okay. Uh, before I go to Councillor Wilson, Gangadhar, if you have anything, and I have a few questions yeah. as well. Yeah. One thing, one thing mentioned was people living longer and many people bed bound or house bound. What sort of additional support are we going to provide to those people isolated in the communities? That can include people of black and ethnic minority communities as well. Language barriers. <clears throat> yeah, so between uh, between the NHS and, and, and uh, local government, um, we currently respond to those all the time. Um, so supporting housebound individuals through uh, services like district nursing, uh, through social work, through domiciliary care, that, that, that happens all the time. Um, is it as good as it could be? No, of course, we can make uh, improvements to it. Um, and I think one of the things we've got to uh, we've got to bear in mind that a, a bit of a switch to digital access during the COVID response doesn't suit many of these people at all, and we can't assume that as a solution. Uh, so that that home-based responsive care delivered by a range of individuals, from therapists to nursing to domiciliary workers uh, to social workers, is um, is, is what we need to do and, and do better. Uh, one of the programmes we've got across the health and care partners in Newham is to look at our home care offer, and that's our health and, and uh, local government home care offer to say, actually, have we got the right suite of professionals? Are we a bit siloed in what social care and health care probably? Could we do this better? So one of the initiatives we're looking at as a partnership is how we do that um, to respond better to those needs. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. If I can ask a follow-up question before I go to Councillor Wilson, um, that um, um, obviously you, 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 you have clearly explained the way you are responding to all these um, uh, needs and calls, but then what is your capacity? Are you capable enough to um, continue the good work you are providing in addition to the additional um, calls you might get? Or, or the support you, we might need in the community. Are, are you, um, do you have the resource and capacity? This is my question, I think, probably. Follow up. <laughs> uh, so we, we don't have a watertight funding solution for health and care. Um, you'll know that certainly from the council side. Um, we've seen uh, greater generosity from a national level in, in the NHS, uh, as was planned. Um, we don't know what the financial settlement is for the NHS next year. Um, there was one planned. We don't know whether that will change. We will find out later this month. Um, what we are committed to do uh, between the council and the NHS is to do our financial planning together and work within the new impound increasingly, pooling our resources, pooling our, our workforce to have the best possible impact, breaking down some of the barriers and uh, that exists between different services, even within the NHS, between uh, hospital care and community care, uh, but and with general practice. Um, so it will always be stretched. We'll always have to make priorities. There will always be difficult decisions, particularly given, uh, as we discussed earlier, the legacy of COVID whenever we're over that. The first challenge for us is to carry on running core services while undertaking the most significant mass vaccination programme the NHS has ever done um, in probably the shortest period that would ever be expected of a mass vaccination programme. Um, so we've got some significant hurdles to jump uh, before we can say we've got a watertight funding solution for, for, for services. Thank you. So besides the funding, I think management is another issue because sometimes uh, uh, officially we see the excellent service you, we, whatever I say, we are providing. But then in real life, actually, if the service has been provided or not, especially when we do casework in our ward level, we do witness lots of negative um, things. When we are called by elderly residents, uh, we don't see the evidence. But obviously, you go for investigation and all the other stuff takes um, quite a significant amount of time and resource again. So, so management is another issue, but I, be, I don't want to be prolonging on that. I will bring Councillor Ali and then Councillor Wilson, please. Thank you, Chair. I mean, there are very pertinent questions and clearly, as you probably know, that uh, we are now uh, working as part of the integrated care system. And uh, I was in a meeting earlier on this afternoon where we spoke about exactly those issues. How do we pool resources? How can we look at the priorities locally? Because clearly the government has now given go ahead to one CCG as opposed to seven. So we had discussion earlier on with regard to how do we make sure that our local needs are going to be driving the, 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 the financial support and the organizational change. And there is a drive now to make sure that we work far more closely in order to actually plan uh, health service needs based on the, the needs of the population as opposed to the way things have worked historically. And uh, clearly we have the disproportional impact of COVID and that is a key consideration that is uh, under discussion at the moment as well. So that is, it's very early stages at this stage. I mean, we only just had the government approval, I think, a couple of weeks back. So we just had this shadow uh, board meeting this afternoon to discuss what are the challenges and the issues that you've raised are clearly on the agenda for future discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'm glad you mentioned about the management of the service because, you know, obviously I said this in an earlier meeting in the context of licensing, for goodness sake, we have a overall um, elected responsibility, whatever our role, whether it's Ulfika as a lead or the ISA as a chair of scrutiny or all of us as elected members for the well-being of our population. So we and I echo what Daniel was saying, and that's why, Steve, I was a bit sarcastic about, because we're going out live here, you know, about acronyms. I happen to know, because I'm quite interested in medicine, about what, you know, some of, some of the three-letter acronyms are. But this, it's, that's a culture as well, I think. In the absence, and I did say this, um, Zulfika, earlier on in an informal discussion, in the absence of a proper protocol between the Health and Wellbeing Board, this scrutiny, 
And, um, you know, I'm, I'm reading from an LGA guidance note that we, we still need to develop an agreed protocol so that people don't have to keep reporting at various points. But I want our officers, whether it's in health or because health are summoned to this, it's not a voluntary activity, you know, um, our officers or health officials or, you know, management to be able to come so that they're not duplicating messages. So um, I think, you know, part of the problem is, is the protocol that we haven't developed. So that's not an NHS issue. That's for us as the local authorities are sort out. But from the NHS point of view, what is a realistic timescale for the review? I think that's an important question, Chair. I don't want to keep bringing people back if they're trying to run a service and keep reporting to various health boards in, you know, Wasm Boris or, or whatever. That's one point. Secondly, I was disturbed to understand that it's all a little bit up in the air with actual figures and we are relying on sort of projected trends from Hackney data. It seems to be that we haven't got enough people who are doing the number crunching. I was told this, and dare I mention test and trace, or the lack of test or the lack of trace or the lack of anything, um, in terms I was told we didn't have the data, you know, even though we were the pilot on a, um, an app. I'm a bit worried that we don't know the scale. It ties up with Daniel's point about underrepresentation. The whole of this commission, you know, we're, we're rightly saying, you know, we've had underrepresentation of men on certain issues or mental health. And as you say, when people don't present on time, you're actually storing up more problems. So it's about three points there, if I may, Chair, to sum up. One is, what is a realistic timescale for it to come back to this statutory function of health uh, function to, to give us a realistic idea of scale? Two, do you think we'll get better at the data? And I do hope we can. And, and three, is that a, a management issue? Because I'm, I'm afraid I'm getting a little bit tired of hearing we haven't got the data. And it's not you guys, it's just you said, you know, I think I'm quoting um, Steve that we haven't had the data on various things. So I'm just worried who, if, is that a... Um, was that something that's a systemic issue that this COVID has highlighted? I'll, I'll let them answer and then I will have a follow-up question from what you have asked, Neil. Yes, thank you. John, yes. Oh, let, let, me, let, me, let me just respond to, so we're, we're delighted to be here um, and uh, happy to be here. We recognise if we don't come, then the police could escort us here in our exactly. duty. To <laughs> like that. <laughs> That's the right answer for that one. And I, yeah. I like it when you say you're delighted to be here rather than just because you're summoned to be here. It's even better. Yeah. Um, uh, well, you've got an excellent teamwork here. <laughs> Go back to Councillor Ali's point. Um, my job is, um, I've been in post for two months now and I represent Elft, Barts, the Council, the GPs and the CCGs. And my job is a is a, a, a partnership function on behalf of health and care partners in Newham. Yep. So I'm able to be with you every time to answer any questions I can. And uh, very happy to be scrutinised and whatever, whatever you feel appropriate. So just to respond to that point, Steve, when do you think is an appropriate time to come back with a output of where we think we are with the, with the long COVID? I, I was going to suggest maybe three months, but I've had make it two if that would suit people better <clears throat> by then we'll have we'll have had a chance to to see the impact of some of our work to reach out to the wider community we'll have an idea of what the levels of demand are and i'm just thinking with the um christmas and new year break yeah. it's yeah. three months rather than two yeah. to get a, a fuller yeah. picture mm -hmm. so thank you for that uh, i'm glad you must have read my mind i was i was hoping you weren't going to say a six month review because you know yeah. we we have six month reviews <clears throat> elsewhere in local authority terms. And I don't think that's very helpful. Can anybody answer my data point or are you sort of worried yeah, about can... where that might lead? We <clears throat> can say all sorts of things as politicians. Yeah, I, 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 um, can, I can answer you know, that. You may not be yeah. in a position where you feel free to, but I am worried about data collection. And is that a, a capacity issue or is it because I'm not saying there's a conspiracy. I don't have I don't have to import transatlantic nonsense about the efficacies of vaccines or conspiracy theories i'm not into that i'm just saying is there an issue that we can flag up because we are emp empowered to make represent uh, recommendations to various people as well as to hear the problem so Excellent. you know i just wondered yeah, if it's you. a data collection issue it just seems to be i think in this particular case with this particular um syndrome 
<clears throat> it kind of um, came up behind us and we didn't know it was there until it hit us. And that wasn't long ago. Um, and also people weren't quite sure who had long COVID, um, who had something else. It, it, so it's only recently we've been able to actually start looking right. at it as a, a separate issue. Um, and I think what we're seeing now is, is, is quite a focus on it. Um, largely, I think, because people who have long COVID have been very organised themselves and said, hey, look, this is actually going to do something about it. Um, and, and I think that... I don't think we've been slow to catch up. I think I think we just literally haven't had the time yet to to, to do that work. Um, where we have done it, it's been done very locally by people who have seen it as an issue and gone and done some work on it. But they haven't been able to do it at scale, which is why I put all the caveats around um, the numbers we've got. It, I mean, the, the 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 data we've got on COVID nineteen itself is 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 now um, pretty comprehensive. Um, that wasn't very good to start with. I think we're in the same position with this. Um, right. we, we'll, we'll start to monitor, monitor it much better. I think that that's as far as I can go, really, at this point. No, no, thank, thank you very much. I just, you know, I just think it's important that we do flag this up, particularly as we're an open committee and we need mm. to sort of represent all sorts of interests at this sort of level. But thanks for that. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Um, I was going to ask you about, again, figures. I'm, I'm looking at page nine, projected demand estimates in Newham. Now, I am kind of like struggling to understand those numbers. Um, so on the second week of December, is, is it the accurate figure or, or project estimated as well? Uh, obviously, January cannot be the actual figure. It is estimated. But I mean, if I look at the figure in October, 16th of October, um, are, are they projected or actual? So those figures are um, estimated on the percentage that we'd um, expect to develop, the, the number of people we expect to develop the syndrome from mm -hmm. the overall <clears throat> prevalence of COVID-19 12 weeks before. That's mm -hmm. failed. Um, what we don't know <clears throat> is whether all the people who actually have the syndrome have come forward and present the services. The point I made earlier, there will be people, and John made it as well, there will be people feeling unwell and wondering why they're feeling unwell perhaps and weren't connected to their COVID illness and won't come forward to see their GP about it. Um, and all the GP won't um, make the link unless it's someone who's specifically going for their 12 week follow up after hospital admission, it won't be obvious. So we don't know whether it's a true figure yet until we get this service running and can start to get some consistent monitoring going. We won't know how accurate those figures are, I think it's fair to say. Okay, thank you for that. Now, yeah. also from the previous slide, I cannot remember which page I was looking at, but uh, the allocation of money out of 10 million, if we have 64K or 68K, it's, it's really a small amount. But uh, how, uh, how was it allocated? I mean, age, ethnicity, um, infection rate, uh, were they considered, did they impacted on, on, on allocation? It, it, it was allocated on the usual formula based on weighted population. So the, 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 um, it's the, the numbers of the population and there's a weighting based on um, various factors, um, social economic factors um, and, and other population factors, the demographics of the, of the population. It was an, an, um, using that usual, in inverted commas, formula that the NHS uses for allocation. In fact, it was um, for... Northeast London, it was £365,000, and that was supplemented by some money that Northeast London had for similar types of services that it, that it uh, was decided to put towards this. So we ended up with a grand total of 501000 to distribute on the, the CCPs, of which um, Waltham Forest, um, Newham, and Tower Hamlets got just short of 200000 well, on, on that note, then I will have two other questions, um, short questions, which is, um, one, I don't know how many hours of pro professionals hours you can get um, out of this uh, money. And number two, the, the um, 
people who need those services, how are you going to be communicating with those, especially who are in need? Are they going to be accessing those services? Are they going to have information that these are the services available for them to, to have? Um, how are we going to be informing those residents who either have uh, language issues, uh, ability, disabilities, uh, living alone, older people, what has been done or what is um, the plan? Thank you. Anyone? So I, I, sorry, I, I missed my, uh, my mute, my unmute button. Um, to take your point about how we reach out the population, I think, as, as I said earlier, we're, we're putting plans together now. Um, we'll be doing something that goes out generally to the whole population to let them know the service is up and running. Once, as, as I said, we're still putting the final details on the service. So once that's finalised next week, we'll put something out generally. And uh, we're starting to work on um, a, a wider campaign uh, in order to reach um, people who we think um, will need a little bit more work to, to make them aware of the service and of their entitlement to come forward for the service. Um, and that will be um, people who unfortunately are, are, are usually um, put in a, a difficult position by their place in society, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't got that plan yet, but that's one of the things I said I'll come back and report on in, in three months time. And hopefully by then we'll be able to look at its effectiveness rather than just what it is. Plan. Lovely. Thank you for that. But again, I think you, we all will be struggling in terms of if you are doing too much publicity and they're not able to look after everyone. Uh, it, it, I can understand the resource limitation everywhere. Um, there are limitations. So do you do, um, who do you prioritize? Same thing, exactly the way we are struggling at the moment with the vaccine, who is going to be prioritized? Yeah, is it the elderly person? Is it a person with uh, disabilities? Is it the person who is working um, for NHS? So same thing would be happening. Any other colleague with any further question? No, on that note, I would say thank you um, so much for um, the time you have spent with us. Um, it's very infor informative, but I'm looking forward to see you again in about probably two, three months time. Um, Roger will be in touch with you, but thank you so much again. Um, uh, Steve, uh, John, and Councillor Ali, thank you. I'll move on to the You're next welcome. item. If I Right. Would you like me to say a few words here before I ask John? Yeah. Um, where are we now? Yes, please. Yes. Um, Councillor right. Ali. So, Thank again, you. thanks so much indeed to colleagues uh, for bringing this report in terms of the elective care backlog. And clearly, Chair, as you know, this uh, has been a ch challenge since March, and uh, we were hoping that we'd be able to catch up. Uh, which I, I do know the hospital have been trying their best to make sure that they try to cover the backlog, but then the second wave have, has come in. So we now have inevitable delays, uh, which, which are obviously having a major impact on people who have been waiting for elective uh, appointments, etc. from the hospital. Uh, I do know that the Barts and New University Hospital are doing all they can to resolve this issue. And we appreciate that this, we are still in epidemic, uh, and clearly winter is now upon as well, which isn't going to help at all. And so in view of the latest situation, you know, we, we obviously need to be far more conscious in terms of risk of getting the backlog down and considering any mitigations. And there is uh, clearly an increasing need to ensure that our communications are consistent to give residents confidence in terms of hospital appointments. You've already heard uh, Steve saying that only uh, white people who know the system, know how to get on the system, are actually getting, you know, making to, to the hospital. But we do need to make sure that the BAM community who has been affected disproportionately uh, are getting the messages through and feeling comfortable to go to hospital. So collectively, you know, we need to look at some sort of communication to restore public uh, confidence in terms of, you know, yes, it is safe to go to hospital if you need to go. And the other issue is where, you know, looking at the trajectory of uh, getting back um, sort of the backlog down, which is going to be a very, very difficult task in view of the fact that we are in second wave and potentially third wave in due course. So 
without further ado, I'll invite colleagues to present their report to you. John, are you doing that? Yeah, sorry, before that, I think we do have um, um, a report from us, but yes. Health NHS Trust. I can see Councillor uh, Wilson indicating to say something. And is it, uh, Councillor yeah. Bond, did you want to? Okay. Yes, Roger. So I just wanted to let Councillor Ali know it's just an information item, so yeah. Bart's won't be presenting yeah. at this uh, moment, so the committee okay. will discuss the information okay. and decide what to do from there. Fine, okay, Thank that's you. enough. That's yeah, right. but I mean, do do we need uh, John and Steve to stay with us, or can we release them? Oh, if they okay. want to stay, yeah. So, so the meaning is up to you. If you want to stay with us, you are free to stay. But if you need to go, you are uh, free to go as well. So, uh, but thank you again for that, uh, Councillor Wilson. Yeah, now I this is my uh, moment to say I better declare a personal interest. I don't think I've ever had to do this <laughs> before as I am waiting for a hip operation. You see where I'm going with this. Oh. Um, I think that the report in front of us is too broad brush, brush in many ways. It reiterate, uh, I want to reiterate what I've said earlier on, that this is a scrutiny function. In the absence of a protocol, these figures may have gone um, from Bart's Health to the Health and Wellbeing Board. So I'm glad if Councillor Ali can clarify that. But it only refers to Newham General. Well, some of us are waiting for treatment in other parts of Bart's Health. And I want to match it with, um, you know, being a white articulate male trying to get navigate myself around this system with <laughs> what we've already said, Councillor Ali, about, you know, people either being fearful of going into hospital or not even knowing how to approach this. So, you mm. know, I've got quite a few questions and I think it's not about just my experience because I don't want to keep talking about that. That's just that these things happen. I want to talk about the report in front of us, which is too general for me. And I think, you know, it, it doesn't, there are people who reside in Newham's area, but who have treatment outside of Newham Hospital. That would be Gosh. my first point. Secondly, we have sort of, it's a bit like when, when I was told that somebody in my casework was told, oh, all operations were cancelled because of lockdown. Well, we know that because it's been on the news. We don't want to be told. We want to know what, what's happening now. Do you know what I mean? I think we, it just says, for instance, to help us reduce waiting lists, we have put measures in place. Well, we're glad about that, but what are these measures? You know, um, three two one that was three two two. Those waiting for an outpatient or elective care appointment at Newham Hospital. Well, there's more than that. There's Whitcross Crosses, but St Bartholomew's itself as the Royal London are being prioritised based on their need. Well, we hope they are. With those most critical being prioritised, yes. I think it was a statement of the obvious. And what we're looking for, I think, in scrutiny is real hard data. There's some data there, but I think that we do need to come back. We've got nobody from the acute trust here to answer. But whether John, uh, just you know, as he's happened to be generous enough to sit, <laughs> sit <laughs> in this item, whether he has an immediate response. Am I being too unfair? Basically, think, is what I'm saying. I, I, if I, may, Ali? Yeah. if I may come in, I think it'd be good, uh, uh, Ted, if you deliberate on this report and raise any issues, then we will quite happily take them back to the to yep. the trust. And actually, yep. I mean, the valid point is that, yes, you know, people don't just go to New Journal, they go to London, they go to Barks and other places as well. So I think we need to look at it in totality. So have a discussion, come up with uh, any suggestion. I've already highlighted a few areas in my introduction in terms of the confidence of people going to hospital and also having a trajectory to see when and how we're going to clear the backlog, which I think is some similar line to what Neil is suggesting as well to some extent. But you have a deliberation and if you have any any further queries, questions uh, in terms of data and numbers, etc., and then we will certainly take them back and bring it back for you. Sure. Actually, this is what is uh, the plan that yeah. after looking at the report, I was going to ask commission members um, of their opinion and take it from there. If, mm -hmm. if we need to invite someone or ask them for a written report, we would have been doing that anyway. Um, also, in addition to that, I was talking to um, Roger Raymond um, um, to, to even today uh, is coincident that um, besides getting information from professional, is there a way we the commission um, scrutiny commission members can speak to some of the the patient directly yeah, exactly. or indirectly? And now I can see we have a colleague present here who is also a patient waiting for his 
I'm, I'm talking about you, Neil, Sir Neil Wilson. Um, no, we I can mean, get information from you. <laughs> scrutiny in its best has people from the public. Absolutely. I remember a superb example of somebody from our acute hospital that was then just called Newham Hospital. It then became Newham University Hospital Trust, asking where the public were. Well, that was on, a, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon. You know, yeah. we are getting better at consulting the patient yeah. voice, mm -hmm. or what some people call service users, you know, yeah. whatever. Yeah. But I think we do need to actually have people come to us as a part of our, you know, research into this. Yeah. Either come to us I think or we go to very them. very powerful, you know, mm. and we get our caseload, and I think it's going to increase on this. Mm. We get this as, as, you know, as Daniel rightly says, we're not here as professional medicos. Mm. We're here to represent people who don't have the, the job and then to act as their advocates. And Absolutely. I think it's an important link that scrutiny can play. Just, just while I've got the floor, then I will promise to shut up. Do how do any other branches of the council? So John, who's got this cross portfolio sort of, you know, you know, cross, you know, um, institutional barrier stuff. Has there, has any other figures been reported to the other areas of the council? Mm, Chair, not uh, in terms of the electives, because this is the only report we have. But uh, good news from your perspective is that the orthopedic centre gateway is, is, I think, still functioning. So you might end up getting an appointment sooner or later. No, 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 no. I don't want to go there because I don't want to discuss that. <laughs> thing about but clearly, we, we, there, 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 there isn't any, any further information that we have at this stage. No, but all I'm saying is before I put my foot in it, if it's gone to Health and Wellbeing Board or if you as portfolio holder has had more information, mm -hmm. I'd rather Bart's came here Absolutely. with a bit more than what we've got. I don't know if colleagues share my concern, but I thought it's a bit general to be told, you know, well, we're, we're prioritising those in greatest need. Well, I'd be frightened if they weren't, mm -hmm. you know. I think well, it's I, this, obvious that that's what quite, they should be. Quite a legitimate question, Chair. I think I suggest you... you put them down and then clearly yeah. we will take them back and get far more detailed information for you. But Daniel's yeah. been very patient while I've been doing Absolutely. my own. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Yes, Daniel, you can uh, please... Well, I, I, I'm afraid I'm in many ways just reinforcing <laughs> what's been said, but um, just a, an ex another example of for the frustration, I thought we were going to get some real meat at 2.3. Um, the expectation in the NHS in this phase was set out by <laughs> Simon Stevens. And then his letter included the following, and it's three bullet points. The first two looked um, looked kind of predictable, and the third one was um, locking in learning, which is a, an interesting phrase that is not very helpful. Um, what I would be interested in, I, I, as I think we all were talking about at the last meeting of this commission, we don't want to spend time in this period uh, sort of asking representatives to come here to give us updates on their micromanagement at a time when people are incredibly busy. But what, given what's been said about the backlog, um, something more specific about the long-term plan with this, the crisis we've now entered, would be helpful. How is how are things going to look over the spring and summer of 2021 and beyond? We're going to have people who, as Neil said, aren't priority, who are going to have long waits now. How is how is the NHS, how is the local NHS going to um, deal with these things over a substantial period? Is there is there um, a plan? And on that theme of not wanting to um, take up unnecessary time on people. I don't think we necessarily need a more detailed report for us if there's material out there that can be appendices to reports, reports have all been already been written for other bodies that then could just be sent to us and said, this is the situation, this has gone to this wing of things, this arm of things, and then we can look at that. No one has to uh, think, oh, New um, Health and so Adult Social Care Security Commission want us to do another report. We want some meat, but that doesn't mean you have to rewrite a new report for us. If the work is being done elsewhere in the system, which I expect it is given the scale of the situation, <coughs> then an uh, appendices just setting that out is absolutely fine. Uh. 
So the, the, one, the one thing we do have in the NHS is uh, an obsession with waiting times. Uh, so there is a huge array of data that exists already going to, to existing committees on this, including uh, analysis of the, uh, the type of people who are waiting uh, and their ethnicity and so on. So uh, if, it's, if it's that detail you're after, we can happily, happily provide that without much extra effort because it's being, it's being analysed already. I think one of the challenges in providing a long-term plan is there are a number of constraints which uh, faces. One is uh, the willingness of individuals to come and access their surgery and their care uh, uh, because of the risk they, they face or uh, perceive they face from, from COVID and infection. Uh, the other one is the capacity that hospitals are able to run at given their, their requirement to uh, socially distance and then deep clean uh, theatres and surgery means they don't they're not running at full capacity um, and then there's the what quantity of the hospital is, <coughs> is consumed from a workforce or indeed a physical uh, capacity by COVID um, versus the routine non-COVID work um, that's what's challenging at the minute particularly as we are um, just about managing to keep planned and elective services going uh, in most of the hospitals in North East London because the infection rate has risen and we're seeing the effects of that in the number of COVID positive patients in hospital. So um, I hope we can bring back a view of certain scenarios of a longer term recovery. <clears throat> Bearing in mind what I've said, we have to, we have to recognise we're still in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, and so being able to rely upon that um, may, may be a challenge, but I think what I will say <laughs> desire to restore these services, the desire to see the cancers, the heart disease and so on is fundamentally there and trying to achieve that as soon as possible. Councillor Yeah, I think the most frightening thing, and this is may, maybe me just being um, over whatever it is about conspiracies as well, is that people have been so frightened about infection rates in hospital that they're not presenting in terms of, uh, you know, some very severe cancer things. And that's, you know, slightly more, you know, that's why I think there is a priority need about just me going on about my uh, pending hip operation. And, and I think it's about that that we want, John, really, how it's affecting different services and how people, because as you say, we, 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 we've gone from an era where we've got waiting time data and all the rest of it. That's, a, that, you know, it's about how we can actually try to help our residents as we're their elected advocates, really, to sort of navigate a system that's always going to be difficult. But can I just go back to the workforce one? Because if people have intensive care units, if they're, you know, high dependency units, if, if whatever, all of those nurses that you... It's not just the surgeons, because I understand it's not about surgery at the moment. I understand this may just be apocryphal, that surgeons are only <coughs> going to their lists on one day a week in certain of our general hospitals, as opposed to five days a week. You know, is that a, a myth? You know, it's things like that. Where are the lists? How far are people waiting? Is there a problem in neurosurgery compared with cardiology compared with oncology? I think I probably know some of the answers, but I think it, that would be helpful. I don't know if you agree, Chair, and others, if that's, you know, rather than just having so many people waiting in Newham or whatever. No, no, you have a fair point, but thank you for that, yeah. And how we might help to, to get over this fear of going into hospital, actually. Which Absolutely, really and does worry me, actually. communication can be the best method of uh, re even re resolving an issue. I mean, we do understand that we have restriction. We all have restriction, no matter what department or, or uh, section or sector we are talking about. But then if we are honest um, uh, with resident, with patient, with service users, they are clever individuals would be able to understand if we communicate in a way they understand. So even restrictions can be communicated in a positive manner, positive exactly. way. Yeah, but then if we start not talking, not communicating, not declaring, not sharing, obviously they everyone have the right to blame the, the decision makers, uh, the people who are responsible. Um, John, Steve, anyone would like to come back on that? 
So I, I think I think in part what what uh, said in the paper about trying to focus the delivery of services in centres, trying to make them COVID secure. So uh, Newham, for example, as was mentioned, you know, is focusing on orthopaedics um, on behalf of a group, and we've got other services such as gynaecology being delivered elsewhere in North East London is trying to get those pathways as simple as understandable and as safe as possible by running, you know, routine uh, procedures of high volume uh, with increasingly high precision, precision hopefully. Um, I think in some ways it goes to that. Um, I mean, I, I think that said, people presenting for GP referrals fell dramatically, even people with emergencies, with strokes and heart attacks, fell by, in some parts of the country, 50%, um, which wouldn't match the pathology of the individuals that you would expect to present in any general population. Um, so I think what I've taken away from this is a thirst for information, what's happened by specialty, what do we think we've, uh, what do we think we've got to particularly recover, what do we think is not presenting that we need to. I think there's probably a look at cancer and then non-cancer as well. Um, and then trying to think about how long is that tail and what the recovery might look like, how long that might take. Again, uh, going back to potentially some some caveats around some of the scenarios of COVID recovery we see. Um, but I'm happily take that back to colleagues at Barts and, and then bring back uh, a fuller report in the new year. Is there, a, sorry to come back, is yeah. there a number crunching on admin? Is there, we, we've got, we've got you know, like how many letters anybody has been ever sent since COVID about what's happening about their treatment. I'm only bringing this up because that's come to my attention that people have tried desperately to find out things and there's not had any communication. It's like, why? You know, I come from an education background. I mean, you, you know, schools have had to keep communicating with text and, you know, I think Zorfa, while he was doing the education brief, you know, know that we're very interventionist now as I'm a governor, you know, texting and everything. People have been left in the dark. And I just wonder if we can have a, a take on that one with it's not just Bart's, it's, it's a national issue, I think, about people not knowing when their appointments or what's happening. You know, as, as I think, uh, Aisha, actually, I think people are more intelligent than we give them credit. But once yeah, you give absolutely. them the information, they're not sort of like, and they're more patient and, uh, sorry, no pun intended, but they're more, you know, they're not an aggressive population generally with NHS. They want to support it, but they also just want to know what's the realistic time scale. Do they have to keep phoning their doctor surgery? Do they need to get their often other relative who can speak English more or have got more competence with sort of like the right language used? Not to be, you know, told nothing, I think is more frustrating. Do you, do you see where I'm going with that, Chair? Yeah. I just think that yeah. might be helpful. Thank you. Uh, one, one question, if I may, Chair. Sh sure, sure, Councillor. Um, in terms of the report, the approach to resolving the issue, they mentioned um, a number of hubs being open. Mm. Um, how many are there? How many are intended? And how active are they at the moment? Are they regularly... Do they regularly see patients? I, I did read something about um, the, um, I think it's Vips Cross, I think it was. Um, I can't remember exactly, but also the, our gateway centre is apparently one of the hubs. And I, I think they, they deal with um, I think they still continue to do elective surgery. Do they also have a backlog there as well? Yes, yeah, so the Gateway Center focuses on uh, orthopedics uh, mm -hmm. predominantly. And yes, they do, yeah. I mean, there is, I think in every part of the country, a waiting list for orthopedics, which was also affected by COVID. So yes, there is a, there is a waiting list to go through quite a long backlog. Uh, of orthopaedics to, to get through um, at that particular hub. I think with some degree of accuracy, and Steve may correct me on this one, I think all elective services are open mm. um, currently across the BARTS group. I can't speak for others um, and are, are working through the backlog. 
However, uh, for the constraints I mentioned before, not all are full capacity that they would like. Yeah. Um, so uh, in some cases, the backlog is growing because they're not able to get through as many as they're being referred. Uh, in some cases, they are working down the backlog because they're able to uh, uh, do more than is, than is currently being uh, received in, in demand. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 I was going to correct you, John, because that's absolutely right. Uh, the, and it goes back to the point someone was making earlier about it would be good to have a a richer report with more detail to, to help you see that. And yeah. the other hub that's um, <clears throat> available in North East London at the moment is, is WIPS Cross for Ophthalmology. Although uh, I'm not quite sure how far advanced that one is. And then there will be others, I think as John mentioned earlier, in gynecology and I think in uh, ENT surgery as well. But they're a bit uh, behind in the planning yet. They're, they'll be the, the next wave. Um, but which course, they're also then orthopedic, is that right? That's a, the, the gateway in, in Newham. That's, that's going to be the hub yeah. for orthopedic. Oh, yeah. Um, no, sorry, um, not orthopedic. Um, um, eyes, you know, the... Yeah, ophthalmology. Oh, yeah, ophthalmology. Yeah. 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 Um, they, they're doing that, aren't they? And I understand that uh, it has a very swift turnaround. Um, that patients normally have the operation in a day and then they're back home and things like that. The majority of cases will be cataracts, which are a, a simple um, couple of hours. In mm. a, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. If we don't have any other question, we can close this item. But I can see a clear indication that we would like to invite uh, Bath uh, uh, sometimes in New Year. Um, date. Uh, can be negotiated by Roger with the individual officers. Daniel, are you indicating to speak? No, no, no. I'm sorry. I was waving my no. pen around. I think I've no. said. I think I've said all I can on this item. No, yeah. no. thank you. So <laughs> you'll be pleased to note, know. Zulfi, Zulfi shares that. I think <laughs> absolutely. No, no. I, 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 as you, you may recall, in my introduction, I did mention both the communication in terms of public confidence and also the trajectory of getting the backlog done. Because when you look at the um, section 3.1 with the waiting times, you can see you've got 11,615 people mm -hmm. who are waiting for outpatient appointments. Yeah. And then you look at, if you look at the benchmarking, you know, comparing with July 19 and then July 20, you know, the waiting time has gone up from 9.68 weeks to 27, 22.78 uh, weeks, which is very yep. long. So that's having obviously adverse impact on people's health. And but so it's that, also that, you know, as a mental health champion, Zolfi, that's why I'm asking this question about if we can communicate, if Bart's can use us to use our, you know, the Newham yeah. magazine. I don't know what, we've got a COVID briefing going out, haven't we? Well, we've well? got, we got 450 you know, COVID We could also teams. give a public yeah. information dimension to this yeah. from the authority's point of view of, you know, reassurance messages or frequently asked questions or something like that so that yeah. people are not left in the dark because... Admin staff are also being affected by COVID. Absolutely. They may be shielding. They may not be able to answer the phone or working from home. I get all of that. It's just Absolutely. about trying to get the right messaging across, yeah. particularly those who are anxious, isolated and stressed because they thought they were going to get mm -hmm. an op operation last January or something. And it's not, a, it's not helpful for their mental health and well-being. Mm. Yeah. Thank you Thank very you. much. Um, so again, thank you so much, John and Steve, you have been very kind uh, to stay for longer and you've been really helpful as well. So thank you. And Councillor Ali, uh, oh, you all you. have been excellent tonight. Um, I'm, I'm grateful to you all. Um, I, I'm happy for you to leave now and we will be moving on to the next item. I'll give a minute so that um, colleagues uh, would have time to leave. But thank you so much and good night. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good Agenda night. item uh, seven. I'm looking at the work work program. The commission will note that the items to be discussed at the next meeting are outlined in the work program report in the agenda paper. Uh, Chair, we haven't decided those items yet. We just need to discuss what we, so we want to. Yeah. So um, we, this is what we'll be doing. Yeah. So the, the information we have on the pack, I would like your opinions. Uh, yes, Roger, do you have any comment to add? Yeah, um, I'll just suggest to the committee that they would invite Bart's to the next meeting. 
Yeah. <laughs> but then again, the, the, yeah. You get a so, thumbs up from me on that one. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's the the other item I need to discuss with the director of public health just to make sure the smoking cessation item is ready for the February meeting. So I will check with the director of public health um, just to ensure that's ha- will it be available so they have a full update for you in February. Um, those two items I think should go to the next meeting. If the smoking one uh, needs to be shifted to March, I will let you know. But I think I would suggest that um, if you have any other additions, that would be helpful and to know. I haven't got it on the screen because for some reason my own personal laptop may plays up whenever I want it to. To uh, is, and is Winston all right there? Or is he frozen? No, 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 I'm not. no, 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 no I'm right. I thought you were either frozen because it's too cold in your basement. No, or... I, I'm reading the agenda. <laughs> right. Sorry. So um, it probably tends to cover the screen. Um, yeah, I, that's what I have two screens. I, it, the work program, we're still carrying on with our focus on mental health. I, you know, at these meetings. Sorry, I haven't got it in front of me. We I had, see this. Oh, uh, mental health and immunization. We haven't um, finished. Chair, we've work. finished the sessions oh, uh, for this. Um, review and at some point before April I will bring a short report and then members will I will discuss with members in January and February about uh, recommendations to go through yeah. to the executive So we haven't got any more sessions on that to invite witnesses or anything? Uh, that's correct so We've got more space Roger, that's what I was getting at Aisha, that we've got more space to bring in things So yeah. I think it is then you know, um, I don't want to overload you know, because we already said earlier on, Chair, didn't we, about resources for this committee. So we need to sort of like, I think, um, you know, concentrate on what we are able to do. And Absolutely. We don't want know, to I, I don't be want to overloaded, too. but then if there is something important and urgent, then we should be able to accommodate yeah. that as well. Exactly. Yeah. So, Sorry, Winston. I, yeah. no, um, I just yeah, want to, I just want to find out if we covered... Um, um, social care. Um, homes. Mm. Uh, we 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 did. Um, the last meeting, councillor. We, we did, did the, that. Oh yeah. Okay. Care yeah. yeah. Care care homes. That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah, care home was done. Was it the last meeting or what meeting before? Last at the last meeting. Uh, yeah. On twenty third of eighteenth of November. We did that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Daniel. Um, Thanks. Um, I'm not wishing to add to the um, six items on the on the to be scheduled list. Um, I so I, I'm happy with what's been suggested so far. I just want to flag that the um, primary care networks um, row that is something that's been I feel like it's been hanging around for a while, and I am keen that we do come to that. Um, but the other matters mentioned as a priority for the next meeting, I, I'm, I'm fine with. I also do, I want to clarify two things. Firstly, I didn't put my hand up at the beginning of the meeting because I thought Winston and Neil were indicating to speak, but actually they were putting their hand up to support the chair. And I apologise if I was not indicating support. So I do that now. And um, the second thing is, by um, in correspondence, I hope I didn't mislead uh, other members and the officers. I, I am keen that we meet in March. I just ha- I was expressing a certain uh, co- um, concern that there's a period in mid March uh, with a pre-election period coming up that sometimes seems to feel incredibly stressful, and that was what I was trying to to mention in writing before the meeting. But um, I understand there's still a date to be set there. Thanks. I'm glad you mentioned about the show of hands, Daniel. Because I thought I was first, you see, but um, I didn't mind. I didn't mind being relegated because it, it gave me more time to think of my question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Roger. Yes, I just wanted to say um, I don't know when the Perda period is going to be. I think the election is in early May, May. Right. so we may be lucky if we have the meeting in March to avoid Perda, or if if it's nothing controversial. We should be able to have witnesses from the NHS to pen, attend that meeting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, it wasn't about us not being able. I assume we can meet 
in late March, April, unless someone's going to tell me we can't. It was more the fact that lots of other things don't seem to happen then, that we seem to have this crammed period of a billion meetings kind of in one week. And that was what I was concerned about. Mm -hmm. sure, Thanks. Sure. But in addition, if colleagues are OK with, I would like to give Roger a bit more flexibility in terms of um, shifting items from one place to another, depending mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. how flexible others, um, if, we, if we can do that. So yeah. that, Roger, yeah? Yeah, I Happy? mean, the, the, the work program is a working document anyway. Yeah. So we can move around, we can shift things around mm -hmm. um, if we saw need to do so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, thanks, Chair. What I will do, I will discuss, um, as I said, I will discuss with the Director of Public Health about smoking and next item. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I think um, Councillor Blaney's uh, dis uh, suggestion, primary care networks, I can yeah. think I'll work to March for that one and then we have more time to add other items to that meeting as well. Would it be logical to bring a primary care and, and um, end of life care together or nearer? No? No, that can be separate, Chair. Mm. Okay. Mm. All right, uh, Neil, you wanted to say something. Yeah, just just to flag up, and we are still on public, um, you know, so that, that that this message gets across. Scrutiny should not be an afterthought. So, in the congested period and in, in the pre-election period, Roger, we as a commission want a meeting. I think in March, we just you know want it scheduled as soon as is physically possible for the scrutiny team, because there's two scrutinies on tonight. Uh, some of us are on various other committees that are part of another type of scrutiny called audit, which is a very important scrutiny of the function. Uh, you've got two strategy chairs that are non-executive parts of the, on this committee on the call at the moment. So we, we, we're, it's not about being busy. It's just as I agree with Daniel, we need to schedule it so that it doesn't feel rushed and that people are not giving the due weight. Because we've Absolutely. been waiting for quite a, a long time for you know Bart's to come and be a, be accountable about the COVID stuff. As as we said, it's not about keep rewriting reports and making them. If they've got something off the shelf, they can just you know present it to us. But we need it to fulfil our function. So I don't want us to be an afterthought in that planning process, Chair. No, I'm sure, supporting that my point. colleagues on this. No, thank you so much. Anything else on that? Nope. Lovely. Thank you very much for that. Now, date of the next meeting, which I have um, 2nd of February. I am sure we have something before that and 18th March. Can, can, can Roger help me with yeah, that? The next meeting is February, 2nd of February, and then mm -hmm. we'll have a meeting in March and I'll schedule them in the schedule in the next couple oh, of days. Okay. I thought we have something in January as well, but not for health. No, the, our first meeting will be the the second of of February. I'm sure there's plenty of other meetings in January. I'll be missing you all on on, on that case then. Um, I'm sure you'll see us in other uh, walks of life. Uh, other I was going to say I won't see you as a scrutiny committee, health and adult social care scrutiny, but. Um, I would like to wish everyone a happy, healthy, I would, I should say, uh, festival session, season and a happy new year. Mm -hmm. And Can thank I say, you. Sorry, before you finish, I just want to say something, but continue. Yeah, Go on. No, I just want to let members know that we were hosting the Inner London Northeast Joint Health Overview Screen Committee um, for the last two years. Now our term has expired at uh, the last meeting um, last month. So that now goes over to Hackney. So we, we no longer hold a chair. And I have to say that our members attending was very grateful as to what we've done here because apparently the, there was some confusion about the actual committee itself because of the elections and so forth. So we undertook it and it was very high praise for the officers um, Roger, and um, and who was the chap before yourself who's no longer here? Anyway, Roger... Robert, did, Robert Brown. Robert, that's Robert. right. Mm -hmm. So Roger um, put in lots and lots of work. And at the end, I think they were very grateful for what we done and thought we did a fantastic job. So I think that's something I'm very proud of. And I personally thank Roger for the amount of work that he actually did. 
because you work very hard to get the committee up and running, to get the agendas, to contact the our partners and so forth. So I thought we did very well for the last two years on that. Well done, Roger. So thank you very much. And it should be uh, minuted as well. Um, so I would, yeah, again, I am I'm really happy with our officers um, and the support I'm getting from Roger, Adrian, Richard, um, you all are excellent. Um, and especially Roger, thank you so much. Sometimes you have been doing things on a very short notice as well. I, yeah, so this will bring um, to a con con conclusion of business of this committee and I now declare the meeting closed.